Hello and welcome to episode 261 of Retro Encounter, RPG Fan's weekly podcast of many topics. I'm Mike Solosi, and today's topic is Finding Paradise, a 2017 indie game made by Freebird Games and Khan Gao. Uh, we will talk about it in just a moment, but first let me introduce my co-host, Zach Wilkerson. Hi there. So, Zach, um, a little bit of Retro Encounter history. Uh, Khan Gao of Freebird Games made a game called To the Moon in 2011, and it was composed largely within uh, one of the RPG Maker uh, programs uh, with, uh, with audio and uh, a lot of effects done by him separate from RPG Maker. And then uh, three years later, uh, he made a, a sort of an integral, an interquill, not like a full sequel, but like a short follow-up called A Bird Story. And we at Retro Encounter did episodes on To the Moon and A Bird Story in 2016 and 2017. And I really enjoyed both of those games. They are super good. Yeah, I mean, I played To the Moon for review um, at the beginning of this year. Um in January, I think. Oh, was there a new port for maybe Switch or PS4? Yeah, and I I'd okay. actually played the PC version immediately before, and I will say that I, uh, in anticipation of this podcast, uh, pulled up to the moon on uh, Switch again, and the controls there are really bad, so if you have the opportunity, play it on <laughs> PC. Um, and then I played uh, Bird Story shortly after, and thought it was super fun, and then sort of in anticipation of the third one coming out, I thought, let's play Finding Paradise. Yeah, and when you say the third one, you refer to Imposter Factory, which is yeah. coming out in late 2020. It, it might have a date, it might not, I'm not sure. Um, I don't think so yet. But uh, yeah, um, To the Moon, Finding Paradise, which, are talk- which we will talk about very soon, and Imposter Factory form a trilogy. Bird Story is sort of, an in- is sort of like an in-between game for before Finding Paradise, and there are also a few small web games that uh, Freebird Games made um, t- to sort of fill in some of the gaps uh, of the story, but... This is the second game of the trilogy, Finding Paradise, which we played for the podcast, which I finished a few days ago. And Zach, I think I finished it in two and a half sittings. Like uh, there, yeah. there um, I, I, I don't remember exactly where, but sort of once I hit a certain point, I just decided I, I need to play this thing through to the end. I need, I, I got to yeah. find out what happens. And it, um, <laughs> it, it was, uh, like, it's a visual novel that has interface that looks like a 16-bit RPG, but, I mean, you know, visual quote, novel unquote, it's a real page-turner. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I finished it in, I guess, probably two and a half sittings as well, but the reason for that last half was because I was getting to the end, and I thought, I know what To the Moon did to me, and I need to not finish this at midnight. (laughs) (laughs) Because I want to, like, I don't know, go to sleep. Um, Just because, like... uh, Ken Gao knows how to have such an emotional impact with his games, and so I decided to wait till the next day, and that was the right decision. I understand. I did not take your advice. I did finish <laughs> this at a very uncomfortable hour, uh, but I, I just had to know how it ended, because I, I knew if I stopped playing and went to bed, I would be sitting in or lying in bed staring at the ceiling thinking about it. So I just, uh, in a poor health decision, I stayed up very late to finish this game a few nights ago, and uh, I, I don't regret finishing it, because this game's awesome, <laughs> But maybe uh, <laughs> maybe three thirty in the morning wasn't the right time to finish it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that might be the time. Almost exactly. <laughs> I think you were... tweeted about it, if I remember. Correctly. Okay, well, maybe I did. <laughs> maybe that must be it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, so it goes without saying, both of us enjoyed this game, but we are going to talk uh, about it in detail. This episode will be full of spoilers, listeners. So uh, no warnings, no disrespect. We're going to go right into it and jump around a little bit, probably, because this game jumps around with its timeline a little bit. It's not really playing fair. Um, but so anyway, uh, Zach and I have both played the uh, predecessor games. We're both looking forward to Imposter Factory, but in the present we are playing 2017's Finding Paradise. And this is uh, centers around the same two main characters, Ava and Neil, who work for a company called Sigmund Corp. And Sigmund Corp has the unusual service of uh, uh, people on their deathbeds. Before they die, they are given the opportunity to have um, Sigmund Corp employees jump into their brain or, or subconscious or something, uh, not terribly unlike the movie Inception, 
uh, and sort of rewrite their memories or plant new memories in their head to uh, to allow them to die without regrets or die having fulfilled a, a dream in their mind that they had not fulfilled in life. And in To the Moon, uh, their client wanted to visit the moon and become an astronaut. And in uh, and it's a little bit different in Finding Paradise. You know, th- there's a couple rules around this. Like, they, they have to hook up um, both the scientists and the subject to some computers. They have to follow rules like uh, there can't be too many logical inconsistencies, or otherwise the, the, the subject won't believe the dreams they're ha- the, the memories that are being created. Uh, there are certain ethical concerns that they have to be aware of, um, and, they ha- and they're, they're constantly monitoring the health of their subject with a little, uh, with a little heart monitor that's in the menu of the, of the game when you're exploring around. And in general, they go from more recent enemies further back into the subject's past, and they have to explore around, solve small puzzles, and find memorable objects called mementos in order to travel further back. So there's like there's a gamification of this of this memory diving that they do, and that's the bulk of the game. Uh, so Zach, having played To the Moon and this, uh, what do we think of? Mm, I, I, like uh, just sort of broad strokes questions like what do we think of the premises of the of these games like and how invested we are uh in in segment corp and its employees i mean i think in terms of the premise i think that the reason that these games work so well uh for me is because of ava and neil and like their interplay um you know like uh, obviously the premise being like you go into people's memories and you change something about their life to make them like realize their dreams. It has its own problems, which I think this game explores pretty effectively. Um, But I love just sort of the interplay between the two of them um, and how it takes what could be oftentimes kind of a slog of a narrative and um, makes it kind of goofy and fun at the same time. Yeah. um, Ava's a little bit more straightforward. um, And, uh, and Neil is a little bit more uh, abrasive and uh and and like like they both have jokes they both have idiosyncrasies like neil uh makes light of the situation and even and uh, and even mocks or taunts eva at times so i i think that in general eva is a little bit more um principled and neil is a little bit more of a jerk and there's also the sort of the the side thing of neil is suffering from some kind of illness that uh, that gives him occasional pain and requires him to take medication and it, it comes out later in the game that uh, Neil had tampered with the uh, equipment that they're using at uh, some time prior to the events of Finding Paradise. Uh, so there's multiple agendas. The, the characters really feel like they have personality and are interplaying off of each other. Uh, and they break the fourth wall with humor a little bit, but never in a way that feels too obnoxious. It, 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 the, these characters feel like real speaking characters. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, I agree with you, and um, I'm not sure that I would qualify Neil as a total jerk. I mean, I think that he he's kind of a jerk, but he's like also so ridiculous. Like, I love like that he calls out like ridiculous like I don't know uh, words as he's like breaking the mementos sometimes, <laughs> um, and that he seems um, to like sort of enjoy his job in like kind of a weird way. Um, it, to me, like that, I I don't know that it just kind of works for me as I, as I'm playing it. And it, it, again, I think that given the nature of the stories that Gao likes to tell, um, I think he manages to like hit a really interesting, like sort of tonal level using characters like Neil um, that like makes it more playable. Cause otherwise like these are so sad that <laughs> it would be hard to spend even the five, six hours in a row. Like we have. Yeah. And uh, Khan Gao, when he was making to the moon, uh, which I think he is being opted into a, uh, either a, either a TV show or a movie, I think. He, I think like, it's a movie. Yeah, yeah. He at least sold a script to some studio, which is which good for him. That's that's impressive. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I if, if my memory serves, he wrote To the Moon, uh, like, because sometime in the 2000s, uh, uh, his grandfather died, and he was very close to his grandfather, and his grandfather speaking about the what-ifs and regrets of his life really affected um, uh, Khan Gao, and he wrote this game as a way of, uh, like, like interpreting grief and regret, uh, in a in a way that was that I think also reflects his voice. Like like I think Khan Gao is this funny person who will make light of certain situations as a defense mechanism, it, it, but 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 also but also respecting the um, respecting the subject and what and sort of what he wants to do. Like I I think that 
the humor and the real poignant moments and the creativity of this of Finding Paradise's script is reflective of the creator itself. And again, he uh, he made it to the moon almost all by himself. And uh, and Finding Paradise has a large number of other uh, of other people in the credits helping with, especially helping with um, certain visual effects. And Finding Paradise is just a much more mechanically sound and I think visually impressive game than To the Moon was. Uh-huh. Um, it, it, like this is a little bit of an auteur kind of indie game, and uh, and it's it's very appreciated. I think I I uh, I thought the writing was so strong, both went both the sort of comic highs and the uh, tragic lows. It's like I, I I teared up a little bit at the end of this game and to the moon because of just how oh. just how touching they they get. Yeah, and I think that it becomes more touching because he manages to hit that tonal balance that as you're saying like that sort of like auteuristic um, tonal balance that is very much him. Um, you could compare it to lots of indie movies, I suppose, in terms of what he's doing, but I think that he manages to strike that balance actually a lot better than I think some uh, of the you know more well-known indie movies that I think sometimes. Um, don't hit it as well. So, yeah, I agree with you. I also teared up. Not as much here as I did with To the Moon, which we'll talk more about later, but I agree with you. Yeah, I mean, not to generalize too much, but, uh, like, when you think of big studio movies versus indie films or AAA video games versus indie games, the the AAA version will always feel more expensive and more crafted, and the indie version will almost always feel more human. It, because like sort of like the bigger and better a video game is the more it, the more you're sort of aware it's a video game and even mm-hmm. though finding paradise and to the moon look like 16 bit rpgs I, I don't know the dialogue hits so well that i sort of believe in these characters more than i do uh oh i don't know what's a big expensive rpg i played recently um persona 5 which is a beautiful expensive rpg with characters that are very well written and feel human, but not in the same way that they do in Finding Paradise. Like this is an indie ass indie game, but in but with like the the good versions of that stereotype. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I agree with you. I mean, even some of the better ones. Like I was thinking of like um, I was playing around a little bit with Trails of Cold Steel three recently, and even there, uh, I think the characters there are strong and they're they're great, but they're still not nearly as human as the ones here. Yeah, it's like in Trails of Cold Steel. I, I finished Trails of Cold Steel two a month or two ago. They're likable characters, but they are clearly anime characters. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and in uh, in To the Moon and Finding Paradise, it's like yeah, they're video game characters, but there's a very, I, I mean, the tone of this game is so personal that it uh, mm-hmm. that it it really resonates. Okay. But well, let's get into these characters a little bit. Um, Eva and Neil are the Sigmund Corp employees, and their uh, their client this time is a man named Colin. And Colin has a is an elderly man. His wife, uh, he has a wife named Sophia and a son named Asher. And when they speak to Colin in his subconscious, he tells he's a little bit hesitant at first, but he tells them that uh, try to make his memories more fulfilling, like he uh, and and see if they can give him fewer regrets, but don't change too much. And w- which is surprising to Eva and Neil because they're not used to a request so vague and they're not used to a request saying them not to change much. So the, I, I think at first they're, they, they aren't really apprehensive. But they're a little confused but intrigued. They're like, all right, let's just go back into this guy's subconscious and see what we can and, and see what we see kind of approach, which is, you know, you know it's a, different from To the Moon where the, the wish of the client was very explicit. Mm-hmm. You know, it's funny because, like, uh, before you even get to talk to Colin um, or get to kind of go into his memories, you're walking into, like, his home. And, like, someone at the front desk says, like, oh, you guys are must be from Sigmund Corp. He's, he's up on the set, the second floor. He probably deserves to feel better. And I was like, what is this game? <laughs> and I thought it was going to go in a different direction, like that maybe Colin would be, like, a not very nice person. Um, but I like that instead it did, like, sort of the vague wish, which distinguishes it enough, I think, from To the Moon in terms of, um, how it's tackling a similar topic. Yeah, in, in, in To the Moon, as you go deeper, and I don't remember the guy's name, but as you go deeper into his into his Johnny, psyche, yeah, 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 John or Johnny, like you sort of realize this guy has been uh, dismissive and mean to his wife for decades, and and he's you know if, if not a jerk, just just not a very sensitive person, and uh, and you don't really, I don't think you really sympathize with the client much by the end uh, until you learn about the past trauma. That's sort of the, uh, the the one of the big plot points of To the Moon. But in Finding Paradise, Colin is an extremely decent person uh, for the entire game. There's no dark secret where that, that, that makes him evil. Just, just, uh, j- j- but there is a secret and he is somewhat troubled. 
that just makes it more intriguing um, with the vagueness of his wish and uh, the fact that he has a loving family that are a little apprehensive of you. Like, like um, uh, uh, his wife, Sophia, is a little cold towards you because her, her thoughts are, do you mean that my husband didn't have a fulfilling life? Does he not want to remember me or our son? Uh, what's going on here? So she's a little upset by the whole situation, and I think Colin realizes this and feels bad, but still wants someone to go into a, to his brain and 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 figure things out a little bit, uh, which I didn't quite understand at first. It, it, it it's clear at the end, but uh, I, I again like I think I was able to understand Sophia's perspective and understand how troubling the idea of what Sigmund Corp is is. And, and and it sort of made sense, but that just made, but that that combination just made me more interested to get into the end of the game, and it, it goes some pretty impressive places. Yeah, and I think that, uh, and we'll talk more about this, I think, toward the end. But one of the things that I like here is that, like, the way that his memories, and as you kind of go through his memories, you get a feel for why he would have said that or why he would have requested that, uh, because he tends to be really, really hard on himself. <laughs> um, like he has uh, regrets about like very specific moments. And that's, I think that almost every memory you see is of a regret, um, even though clearly he is like a super nice guy. Um, and so I think that um, picking up on that pattern sort of gives you a feel for like him, like having this vague sense of emptiness despite the fact that his life has been fulfilling in almost every way that he could have imagined uh, at least in the second half of his life so I think that ends up being a really relatable character I think because of that at least for me I tend to maybe when I'm telling stories focus on the negative and I think that um, Colin does as well well I mean you sort of remember negative criticism more easily than positive criticism mm -hmm. I, I think it was a uh... Oh, uh, I, I think it was I was uh, listening to an episode of Freakonomics where they they talked to sociologists and they mentioned that it 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 almost takes four good memories or four uh, four good things to happen to equal the sort of emotional weight of one bad memory uh, or four or uh, one bad thing that happened. So the fact that like the the more negative emotions rise to the top a little bit makes sense and. Um, it's, they do this a little bit differently than in To the Moon. In To the Moon, you go back in time through John, Johnny's brain uh, linearly, but in this, t in uh, Finding Paradise, it's like a convergence. Like you'll have one scene as elderly Colin, and then you'll go to childhood Colin and go forward in time a little bit, and then it's it's almost like a spiral going towards a center, which they represent visually <laughs> on a on a, a little timeline graphic that's very helpful when they're explaining it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I like I like the visual too because like it indicates to me like how far am I into the game, <laughs> which is one of those things that as a reviewer I'm always curious about. So I liked that, um, but yeah, I think it's an interesting twist on it because really the central moment that they want to look at is in the middle. And, I, and the only thing that I kind of was a little bit iffy about was the way that they're slingshotting back and forth, which apparently has never happened to them uh, to Neil and Ava is like someone else I would have ma imagined would have had some like central issue um, that happened like halfway through their life that like was the thing that everything sort of turns on. So I was like, I a little bit confused by why that was the case early on. I'm like, this must have happened before, but then it, it makes more sense later. Yeah. In, I mean, the, this game has a tendency of Eva or Neil sort of saying my thoughts out loud, like immediately yeah. after I think them where like when this, when they first notice the spiraling thing, Eva says, Hmm. So we're probably hurtling towards some special turning point. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> Which again made sense to me, but also this it's a, it's very remembrance of things past or 100 years of solitude that you know a memory from the present triggers something from the past which triggers something different in the, different in the future like 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 the, it's sort of going from concept to concept instead of back in time linearly you know it feels l like the very nature of memory which is so I'm, I am a little surprised that this is the first time they've observed something like this because you know you know you know like our dreams and our memories don't always travel in straight lines but. Mm. So, so they go back in, uh, back in time uh, and, and forward in time, seeing the life of Colin. Uh, he's a, an awkward sort of lonely child until he meets a young woman named Faye who lives uh, in the apartment across from him. And uh, he, at, at first he tries to send her a message on paper airplanes, and, and Colin uh, is, is a lifelong uh, lover of birds and paper airplanes, which is made very clear in the, uh, in the prequel, A Bird Story. 
and uh, so he's uh, passing messages back and forth to Faye. Uh, Colin is learning cello in the school orchestra, and Faye plays guitar, and she, she goes to a nicer elementary school that's a little down the way. And so they connect over music, and Faye's a little bit more uh, outspoken than Colin is and pulls him out of his shell a little bit. And, and, and so, the, so Colin and Faye grow up together, and uh, but Faye is not in the scenes with Colin where uh, in the second half of his life, where you see him, you, you, you see him in middle age with uh, with his wife Sophia, and you see his son Asher grow up in reverse. But other, uh, but Faye is not present there at all. So from the very beginning, I was thinking, oh no, something happens to Faye, and that's what happens at the center of that spiral, and I was. Right and wrong about that, which we will get into very soon. But I um, for for either half of that timeline, Zach, was there a specific memory or a specific scene that you really loved? I think that um, I, I maybe I'm always sort of like more interested in childhood stories. But I thought that some of the scenes with Faye I thought were really moving. Um, in particular, when she's helping him with the uh, learn how to play the cello more effectively. Um, so like he's playing scales and he's not doing it very well, and so she pulls out her guitar. Um, and Faye's not very nice to Colin, um, but um, not very nice to him in a way that like continues to push him. And I like the dynamic between the two of them. Um, and I thought that just sort of the way that she helped him in that moment sort of achieve something. And he becomes like a like worthy of being in like a local orchestra good uh, because of the way that she presses him and pushes him early on. So I thought that was a lovely scene. Yeah, and um, uh, Colin basically is, uh, I don't think the playing the cello, is, he's, I don't know if he's ever a professional, but uh, I mean, again, he, he's able to join a local orchestra. It's clearly a lifelong passion of his. And I mean, I was really amused by the scene in childhood where he had to play the cello because there was no other instruments left when he was in elementary yeah. school. <laughs> and, uh, he, and, and he wanted a smaller instrument like a violin but, uh, or a clarinet, but he had to pick the cello, which is as big as he is. And uh, Faye would make fun of him for it, but he would soldier on anyway. And you see him... Uh, play the cello with his wife Sophia in the future because um, Sophia is a concert pianist and and is a professional, uh, at least more so than Colin is, and, and and he plays the same song with Sophia or at least a similar one that he played with Faye as a child, where Colin plays a simple scale or a simple circle of fifths, while Faye on guitar or Sophia on piano plays a more elaborate accompaniment that's very beautiful and and this, uh, the, the having you know Colin and other characters be musicians helps the soundtrack of this game because there's a lot oh, yeah. of there's a lot of like just truly beautiful cello piano duets <laughs> and, yeah, it's and, stunning. and 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 like and like small chamber group kind of uh uh kind of instrumentation in the soundtrack it's so beautiful oh my god and uh and uh and just and just hits you can tell the exact arc they're going for the exact emotion they're playing for with every piece and how it fits with the cutscenes it's it's a awesome soundtrack i loved it and like and and they would have scenes of say colin and sophia playing together and then uh and it would just be part of the regular soundtrack and then the scene would be over and it would get to ava and neil talking or something but the song would continue and elaborate mm -hmm. and just there was just the transitions in and out and the pieces themselves are so seamless and beautiful it's a the soundtrack is a major highlight of this game it's, yeah. it's, it's I mean, so I... good yeah, I mean, I love the way that uh, Gal plays with like non diegetic and diegetic music, and sort of mm -hmm. pulls them back and forth, and and I think that um, you know, with uh, I wrote a review of To the Moon, and I said like, hey, when you play this game, please play it with headphones on, and I actually think I like the soundtrack here a little bit more um, because of everything you're talking about here. I think the way that he plays and remixes different melodies uh, with different instrumentation um it, it creates an emotional through line um that i don't think even it would not be nearly the experience that it is without the stunning music i i of all the things gao is good at i think music might be the thing that i'm most impressed by actually yeah um i am sometimes an advocate of listening to podcasts while playing the video games i have done that for thousands of hours probably but uh i do not advocate that for this game uh no. like put on the headphones and listen because the music is important and stunningly beautiful. Uh, we didn't even mention Colin's real job. He becomes an airline pi pilot. And uh, you see in, his, in the future scenes, or, or the late age scenes, of him like going on his, his last flight and then eventually his first flight. And as a child, um, Faye sort of pushing him, hey, figure out what, what you got to do to be a pilot. You love paper airplanes and birds more than anything. 
And so she pushes him into attending a flight school. And in maybe my favorite joke in the entire game, he meets a flight instructor who said, I used to be a skywriter, but they fired me because I'm bad at spelling. And then a few <laughs> minutes later, they skip ahead to when Colin proposes to Sophia and his, he hired his old flight instructor to, to write, will you marry me in the sky? And he spells like three words wrong. It's, it's, <laughs> it's hilarious. Uh, will with only one L and Mary spelled like Merry Christmas. I think um, it's amazing. Yeah. That, that was a, that was a, a, a spells okay. Sophia's name too. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think he's, he wrote Sophia as as uh, as two words like Sophia. Will you marry me? <laughs> <laughs> Again, that's a joke that only takes about a minute, but it's a it's, it's a great joke. Again, this, the timelines sort of converge uh, right around where uh, Colin goes on his first date with Sophia. And like, like uh, Faye is going like, "Hey, ask her out, ask her out." You, you, I know you're interested in her. And uh, but on the all the scenes with Sophia, Faye is nowhere to be found. So converges at a moment where Asher takes his, I think, I, I think it's his final flight at his little flight school because the airport's about to close down. The airport mm-hmm. where he did his all of his hours of training. Uh, so he's just so, sort of like a final flight, and I'm like, and my first thought is, "Oh no." Uh, that he's gonna crash and he'll survive, but Faye won't. And then my second thought was what the actual truth was. I uh, I'm not gonna say I was I was a genius and predicted the twist of this game, but I noticed enough hints that I kind of figured yeah. it out as it was happening. Um. So do you want to get I, into it, Zach, or do you want to? Yeah. Hang I mean, uh, go ahead. Yeah. Faye is Colin's imaginary friend. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, she exists only in his mind. Uh, that's why all of the scenes with Colin and Faye are either just the two of them alone or uh, or her sort of not interacting with him while he's interacting with others. Mm-hmm. You know, the thing I think that gave it away to me, and I, I, I kind of figured it out earlier, um, is he gets hired at the uh, airport, I guess the miniature flight school airport that is run by the family and I like all the Godfather references I thought were really amusing. Oh yeah. <laughs> when they were doing that. There's a scene early in the game where he's watching the Godfather on TV as a child when he's probably mm-hmm. a bit too young for the Godfather and probably yeah. skip ahead. Uh, probably the owner of the, of the flight school was just wearing a, like a, ma- a mafioso kind of suit and tie and hat. And, <laughs> and so his memory conflates that with the movie. So it, it, it's like, <laughs> There, there's even of uh, there's even a on the day of my daughter's wedding kind of like line or something. <laughs> you ask me to be your flight instructor, <laughs> and uh, it's uh, kind of delightful. It's like, like let, let's make you. I'll make you an offer. You won't refuse. Like like uh, <laughs> like like things like that. So so it's a, just a and a, and Cute. the soundtrack is not quite the theme from The Godfather, but kind of close. So yeah. uh, not I, quite I, Nina Rota, but it's it's there. Yeah, just, but, just a, it, a, a a sort of a reference joke that I thought worked very uh-huh. well. But she's, like, hanging out there constantly while he's working. And she's just, like, laying down, like, in the airport. And I'm like, this seems this seems a little odd. So at that point, I was like, all right, I think that, given the nature of this, that she's probably his imaginary friend. But it, I didn't, it didn't bother me that I called it beforehand because they end up doing such interesting things with the imaginary friend angle afterwards. Mm-hmm. And, and when they figure it out, because, I mean, Carl, uh, Eva and Neil do figure it out. I think they wonder, like, is he schizophrenic or or is this a hallucination? I don't think that's the case. I think Colin was just a very sort of introspective, lonely, imaginative boy who uh, created the friend because he didn't have any friends and like, missed his bird friend from a bird story. And so he sort of made fate to to help him to have it. To, so he had a partner to practice his scales with. And so he had someone to talk to when he was home alone all the time. And uh, and she pulled him out of a she- out of his shell. It was almost a way of his subconscious prodding him to act out a little bit. Uh, it was. Uh, I, I don't think he was schizophrenic, which is you know I, I suppose a, a reasonable uh, a idea you could have about this game, but, but which I don't quite believe in. And and it, there reached a point where he's dating Sophia. He's becoming more of a professional. He becomes a professional pilot that where he doesn't really need Faye anymore. And and mm-hmm. sort of the and, and the the arc of his life. Uh, before the Sigmund stuff happened is he grows up with this imaginary friend and then right around he starts dating his future wife his imaginary friend leaves and then the turn happens because right where uh, Colin I'm sorry right uh, well, yeah like right around that center point where Colin goes on his final test flight Eva and Neil are trying to figure it out but they, they can't f- 
break the final link to go deeper into Colin's mind. They're they're a bit of a they've hit a bit of a wall. Uh, Ava disappears um, into Colin's psyche. You you control Neil freely for a while and can jump between his memories in almost like a little a little world map for a while. That where uh, it, w- without much success, and Neil realizes that the obstacle is Faye, and they've encountered. Uh, this is my interpretation here. They've encountered the memory of Faye in Colin's subconscious, and she's res- she's resisting this. She does not want to be erased. Oh, I don't think that's interpretation. I think it's yeah. text. I mean, they they don't realize at that moment because they think that it's like some regret over a lost love for a long time, and they're. Mm-hmm. Uh, the game sort of sets you up to think that a little bit. Um, and yep. I think that very clearly she is resisting the notion of being removed from from his memory because they think that by removing her, we'll get rid of all of Colin's regrets, which obviously is not what the reality of the situation is. Yeah, and uh, and the scenes with uh, Faye battling Neil and, and Ava, but, but mostly Neil, because they're, 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 these are it's a one on one with Neil for a while are really amusing. They, uh, uh-huh. they, I mean, they enter two of my favorite arcade genres, fighting games and, and, uh, and, 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 uh, and, uh, you know, 2d shmups for some rare gameplay that is not walking around talking to people <laughs> in these <laughs> games. Uh, and, and Faye it has, you know, has brown hair and some of her motifs are like firing lasers or, uh, or birds at Neil, which is, you know, like, I think that maybe, uh, uh, Colin conflates his memory of the bird with his imaginary friend, so Faye has some brown bird like qualities to her, uh, and, and and like so Neil fights Faye unsuccessfully, and it reaches a point where they're worried that uh, that Colin might die, and Eva and Neil could um, will either accomplish nothing or they'll die w- when Colin dies in the real world. So th- there's a, a bit of a crisis moment. They manage to contain and defeat Faye. Uh, but uh, at, like, n- like Neil has sort of a moment alone with Faye that the player doesn't see and they sort of reach a compromise. And mm-hmm. what ends up happening, uh, we're going to jump around a little bit into the moon. You sort of discover the, uh, the unfortunate truth of what, ha- of, uh, of um, the relationship between Johnny and his wife and, uh, and a traumatic event that happened to Johnny and they sort of rewrite uh, his life. So he does. So the relationship with his wife is better and he accomplishes more and that childhood trauma is gone. Um, In, in this game, basically Neil negotiates with Faye and at the last moment, there's a bit of a RPG final boss moment where uh, like they fight Faye in a scene that is a little bit reminiscent of Kefka in final fantasy six yeah, and, I love the way that she comes down from the sky. She comes down with the sky <laughs> with angel wings. She's brown instead of purple, but I'll let that one slide. And then, um, <laughs> and then, sort of after that, you wander around a landscape that's uh, Neil's. I'm sorry, Colin's memories falling apart because he he may be on the throes of death, and and, and it's a bunch of you know floating rocks in in an uh, in a in a void. That's you, you know, you and I have played a lot of JRPGs. We've seen this. Oh yes. Um, <laughs> But the final moment, uh, Eva leaves, uh, ejects herself from Colin's mind before Neil does, and Neil basically uh, calls Faye back saying, look, I think you should rewrite Colin's memories. Um, And Faye is a little surprised, but accepts. And then Neil leaves, and uh, just before the credits, you see what Faye does, and she preserves Colin's entire childhood. She does not delete herself. And then... In the second half of his life, instead of all those regretful scenes that we saw, like of him, you know, you know, uh, getting into arguments and like failing to land his final his final flight uh, smoothly, you see more scenes of celebration that are hinted at in the game, but never, uh, but 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 never shown. Shown like we see, uh, we we don't see Colin and Sophia's wedding uh, in the, in most of the game, but in the final scene that, uh, that Faye is rewriting, we do. And we, and we, we find an old soccer ball in the attic of their apartment, and which is a pretty large apartment. I think that, that, that apartment would go for, an, would have an absurd yeah. rent if it was where I live. Where, which yeah, is I'd a, like to live there. Ex- <laughs> anyway, I live in an expensive area, so I'm always impressed when I see, you know, livable houses anywhere. But like, we see a soccer ball in, in their apartment, and then we see a scene of Asher, uh, Colin's son receiving a, a soccer ball as a birthday gift and be, and being a really happy little kid and and, and Asher graduating from college and more scenes of 
the orchestra performing. Like it, uh, Fave rewrites Colin's memories to have fewer regretful and more happy memories rising to the top, and then mm-hmm. she erases the memory of Colin visiting Sigmund Corp to cert- to um, to have his to have his uh, memories rewritten, and gives herself a final conversation with Colin, with Colin as an old man and Faye as a uh, as a as a young woman to say a final goodbye. Mm-hmm. So like. Faye, who who is part of Colin's subconscious, but we're treating her like she's her own person. Faye just wants the best for Colin, which is why she left, and why she wants to just have him remember the good times. And it, yeah, that was I, it, it was such a sweet interpretation, and it, it ultimately fulfilled Colin's wish. They didn't they changed hardly anything, and and left him with uh with fewer regrets and more happy memories. And it, but ultimately it was Colin that had to do that himself. And not uh, anyone from Sigmund Corp. And in, and ultimately, like as an imaginary friend, she has to be part of his subconscious. So like she understands what he needs more than Neil or Ava ever could. And so I like that what they do with this game, and I, and I like that it's different enough from To the Moon, where To the Moon really inserts a new memory in there, but ultimately still maintains the relationships there. Whereas here, it's all about change in perspective. Like I don't think outside of the Sigmund Corp mm. thing. And outside of that last conversation with Faye, it's really just, okay, instead of focusing on, like, that time you spilled lime juice on Sophia, let's talk about, like, I don't know, all the good times you had on your, your honeymoon. Like, that's such, a, that's such a very particular regret of somebody who really obviously tends to be very hard on themselves because that's, like, people spilling something at a restaurant happens all the time, right? Um, and so I, I love the way that it plays with the same themes of To the Moon, but it makes it, 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 it twists perspective instead, and I think that's really lovely. Yeah, I mean, that's the difference between the endings of those two games. In, in To the Moon, they rewrite his memory and cover up or adjust some of the negatives but in, in Finding Paradise, they change perspective and not event, which I, I think is just, is just brilliant in explaining what Sigmund Corporation does and can do and, uh, and the way that the human mind treats memory. And, uh, and, the, and I think in both of those games, they either found the right outcome or found a satisfying outcome, mm-hmm. even though there's, there's very sad parts attached to uh, the events of the lives of the characters in both games. But and at the very end of the game, they leave it on a bit of a cliffhanger. Um, uh, Neil has been tinkering with the uh, with the equipment that Sigmund Corp uses. It, it might have something to do with how uh, Faye was able to seize control of the equipment to a degree. We're not, that's, a, that's a little vague. What's going on? But ultimately, I think we know that Neil has some kind of illness, and I think that Neil uh, is trying to use Sigmund Corp technology to change something within himself or fix something, and he enlists the helps of uh, two other co-workers, Robert and Roxanne, who are have minor roles in uh, in Finding Paradise. But it, it's unclear what the stinger at the end at the end of the credits is. But Neil, Robert, and Roxanne are going to use Sigmund Corp technology to some unknown unknown end, which I think is going to get uh, addressed in Imposter Factory. But I'm invested enough in these characters and uh, believe enough in Kan Gao that I, I mean, yeah, that game is immediately getting wishlisted by me. I I cannot wait to see what they do for uh, the third game in the trilogy. Yeah, I mean, it's fascinating because I, I, until you mentioned it, like the the fact that Neil was ill, which I knew, but I, I didn't make that connection that like maybe one of the things that he's doing is trying to manipulate the machines to be able to do something with him. So it wouldn't surprise me if the subconscious that we're in in game three, and that would certainly be a change from the first two, would be Neil's memories. Um, I think that could be really interesting. Um, yeah, it, it, it could be Ava and or Robert and Roxanne entering Neil or them using the technology to do something else. I, I, I don't, mm-hmm. I, I, but I think it's, I think it has to do with Neil being ailing somewhat. But I, I, other than that, I have, I have no insight. I am, I am, <laughs> I'm going to go into that game probably mostly cold like I did with Two of the Moon and Fire, Finding Paradise. I'm, I usually don't shy away from spoilers, but for this one, I figured it would be more fun not to look it up ahead of time, especially since it's not a very long game. I think Two of the Moon and Finding Paradise are both around five hours, and A Bird Story is around 90 minutes. So um, so like if, if the price is right, then I, they're, I, it's a 100% recommended from me. And uh, 
it, yeah, like the the whole game, I was either intrigued or feeling exactly the emotion that they wanted me to feel. It, it's a it's a beautiful, beautiful video game story. Yeah, I, I love the the subtlety of it, um, and it, it didn't hit me quite as hard as To the Moon, but it does other things way better than To the Moon. Like I think the mechanical stuff they do with all the fights against Faye which are probably where most of those additional game yeah. credits came from, if I had to guess, <laughs> probably. Uh, were really amusing and fascinating and like something that I was absolutely not expecting. And so that was really fun. And I think that um, even without maybe the gut punch that To the Moon had, I think that the subtlety of it is actually in a lot of ways more mature than To the Moon. It feels like a more mature story, even if it didn't hit me as hard. I mean, both of those games hit me hard with the, with their you know most poignant story moments. But Finding Paradise, I think it, it incorporated music a little better, and um, and 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 treated the ideas of memory and regret in more. I don't know if mature is the right word, but but more just just a more interesting, more nonlinear way that I just thought I, I thought that Finding Paradise was overall a more impressive package than what To the Moon was, and I, I would recommend playing To the Moon first, but you, you can enjoy Finding Paradise on its own, um, and but it, it's, it's this is just a good series. It's and it's again like I remember thinking a Bird Story felt like a, a really good silent movie. Mm-hmm. Uh, Fall Finding Paradise just feels like just a great indie movie with characters that could not exist outside of video games, but feel like real human characters. It's a, I, I had so much fun. I had so much fun uh, playing this. I'm glad that you suggested it for the podcast, Zach, because I, you, again, you suggested this as an episode a month or two ago in anticipation of Imposter Factory, and because we'd already covered To the Moon and a Bird Story, and the timing was perfect. Now I am way more excited for Imposter Factory than I was before playing this game. I'm I'm Absolutely. I'm ready to roll on it. Oh, me too. I mean, I I had played To the Moon and I played A Bird Story and listened to the episodes and I thought, I'm going to make Mike play Friday Paradise for the podcast so I have an excuse to do it. Yeah, yeah you so did. It, it was, and it was a good idea. <laughs> <sighs> so yeah, I mean, this is a recommendation from both of us. I, I think uh, the version of Finding Paradise that I have owned for a few years now didn't come with a soundtrack, and I'm going to go find a way to buy the soundtrack because it's because uh, uh, that was so impressive to me. But speaking mm-hmm. of making Mike play things, um, <laughs> uh, next week we are playing Final Fantasy X-2 for the month of November. We're doing two episodes on it. I need to get back to that thing immediately after we're done recording here because I'm still in Chapter 1, and I have uh, I got to get some more hours into that thing before I can uh, start talking about playing dress-up with parts of the cast of Final Fantasy X. Oh boy, that game—that game is something. But I, I'm not, I'm not, I haven't formulated a, a real, you know, informed opinion yet. So we will see how that goes, and we will. And the next two episodes of Retro Encounter are going to be about Final Fantasy X-2. And also later this month, we're doing an episode all about crowdfunding. Uh, I'm going to try and bring back a, uh, a a podcast regular that hasn't been on an episode in a while to uh, to talk about that because um, because uh, crowdfunding and Kickstarter has been really important to. Uh, I would say to, to indie RPGs and also sort of that mid tier of video game budgets. That I think I know who you're talking about. Now I'm really excited. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you, you were you were checking the the Google Doc or some Trello messages or <laughs> no, something. I, it really wasn't. I, I just right now I'm like, oh, I know who that is. <laughs> yeah, but but any, but anyway, um, we're gonna do an episode and talk about uh, a lot of different indie RPGs and crowdfunding and Kickstarter projects. Uh, um, later this month because there's, there is a lot of material to go over there that I'm uh, really excited to get into. Um, but also, you know, I can talk about December. Why not? We're, already, we're only a month away. Uh, Tales of Fantasia hits its 25th anniversary in December. It came out in December 1995 for the Super Famicom. And to celebrate that, we are doing a special episode all about Tales of Characters. Uh, and because I miss playing fantasy football, we are going to do another fantasy draft um, it's going to be a Tales of Fantasy draft similar to the Final Fantasy draft from last year, but with Tales of characters, and I'm bringing a few enthusiastic Tales of fans on the podcast with me. That's going to be in early December. And later in December, uh, you know, I mentioned at the beginning of this episode that we played To the Moon as sort of an indie games month for Retro Encounter. That was in, uh, that was in 2016. And then we had another uh, indie games month in 2018, uh, early 2018, I think January or February. And so we're going to do an Indie Month the 3rd for December 2020, and it's going to be the entire oeuvre of Supergiant Games. We're having one episode on Bastion, one episode on Transistor, and one episode on Pyre in December. And I've played uh, Bastion and Transistor, but not Pyre, so I'm going to 
very, very enthusiastically uh, explore or re-explore the Supergiant Games lineup uh, for next month. Um, yeah, Indie Month 3, not quite the same as Indie Months 1 and 2, but I'm really looking forward to it. <sighs> Zach, thank you so much for talking about Finding Paradise with me. Um, I was, it was a total delight playing this game in, again, only two and a half sittings. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I had a great time with it. I, it, it exceeded my expectations. I usually expect a sequel to let me down a little bit, and it did not. Yeah, my expectations were either met or exceeded the whole way through. And uh, listeners, I hope that your expectations were met or exceeded in this episode. Thank you so much for listening. Um, if you want to interact with the podcast or send us a suggestion or a message, the best way to do so is to email retro at rpgfan.com. Uh, you can also comment on RPG Fans' message boards or visit the Facebook page, Instagram page, Twitter page, Discord server, or Twitch stream of RPG Fan. It's called RPG Fan or RPG Fan Com in all of those places, and you can find links to all of our content delivery systems on RPGFan.com. And speaking of content, we're only one of four podcasts on RPG Fan. There's also Random Encounter about randomness, Rhythm Encounter about RPG music, and Phoenix Edge, another weekly podcast mostly focused on current events. So you can review Retro Encounter or those other three on iTunes or Google Play or Podcast Addict or however you are listening to us. We love feedback. Give us feedback. But if you want to give specific feedback to either of us individually, let's tell you how to do so. Uh, Zach, how can listeners reach you? Uh, you can reach me by email at ZachW at RPGFan.com or you can find me on Discord at ZachW. And listeners, you can find me most easily on Twitter. I am at the Real Monsoon most of the time, at Evoker for Dogs other times, and on the RPG Fan Discord, I am Monsoon Mike. Yeah, Zach, again, thank you for suggesting I play this, because I'm not sure I would have on my own on my own accord, and uh, I really don't have any regrets. This was just a beautiful, beautiful game that I'm still thinking about several days after beating it. Yeah, thanks for playing it with me. And listeners, thank you, good night, and good luck. What?